we were very intentional about uh, we're not going to get together and and just talk about uh, prisons and mass incarceration and and the church without uh, asking folks on the inside what they thought we ought to be talking about. And so I, I basically issued an open invitation from the pulpit saying, you know, whoever wants to go the next time when I go, come on and join me and and we'll just have a, a little group meeting with, with uh, folks on the inside over at Riverbend. And there was a group of uh, five who said, we, we want to do this with various degrees of uh, fear and trembling because um, most of them had never been uh, inside the prison before, and so that was a huge step. And before we went in, I asked all five of them to just kind of think about with what kinds of feelings they were approaching this, and maybe chot it down so they wouldn't forget <laughs> what it felt like before they went in. And then we had these, these two Monday nights where we went out and, and, and just spent a couple of hours talking. And after that, I asked them, you, you know, just kind of quickly jot down what, um, what you take away from this experience. And then I asked the, 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 the bravest one to step up and, uh, and sit in front of a group of people and talk about that experience. And that's when the ranks quickly uh, got lighter. <laughs> but Nancy's a, brief, a brave soul, and um, she said, I'll, I'll do this. So here we go. Um, I wrote mine down because I wasn't sure if looking out at you I could keep everything organized in my head. So I volunteered to go to the Riverbend Maximum Security Prison a few months ago. Uh, prisons are institutions filled with suffering, dysfunction, conflict, and a lot of need. And that's right up my alley because I have a master's in counseling and I've spent a lot of time being a therapist as well as dealing with uh, severe behaviors, uh, negative behaviors with children and so I do a lot of conflict management in my work now. So I felt like this is a place where I belong, my heart and soul is there. So I volunteered for the first meeting that Thomas invited us to which was April 22nd. And I didn't want to commit to both. He gave us two dates to go to because what if I was thinking to myself, what if I didn't like it? So I reluctantly signed up for both weeks. I wasn't scared, and that wasn't my hesitation. Um, I think probably because of my experiences with diverse populations and diverse emotional levels, uh, that prison didn't scare me. It's just that it was so far away in an area of town that I don't visit. It just seemed like way over there, something that wasn't part of my life. And then I also thought, um, well, I'm going to have to tell my boss I need to take off to it, you know, a little bit of time in the after both afternoons. And I was hesitant to do that. I didn't like doing that. And then I also thought, what well, Thomas has this group of people, you know, that are already going, that are very compassionate people, and they didn't need me. So, you, I, yeah, I was thinking, what could I offer that they couldn't? So I didn't really need to sign up for both, but I did. So when we arrived, um, it wasn't easy. It was, as I said, a drive out there, it looks like no man's land, lots of gates and uh, locked doors and barbed wires and it's really kind of sad and we were we got into the group and um, you know we were kind of tentative we weren't exactly sure what the agenda was and then somebody spoke up and said what our purpose was there and then we each went around the room introducing ourselves saying a little bit about why I am here so what I said was, I came tonight because I don't understand why someone who has spent time in prison would ever put themselves in a position that would put them back in prison. And that felt good to get off my chest because it was some kind of resentment I felt towards prisoners, I think. And I looked out at them, just as y'all are kind of looking here, and there was no judgment. Nobody was like, well, you have no idea, lady. Um, it was all acceptance, and they were truly grateful that we had come to visit. 
So each of us gave a brief response. Some were naive like mine, and there was no judgment, only acceptance and appreciation, as I had said. We talked about the challenges of the parole system, the government that surrounds that. We talked about forgiveness and love, loss of family and loss of friends, and the prisoners shared their disappointments and hopes with us. And after two hours of talking with them, I realized that my life had changed. I wasn't thinking anymore about what I could do for them, but I was thinking about what they had done for me. These were men who have had a long time to think and contemplate and wish and fear. They were seeking forgiveness, and this is a place where a lot of that is needed. And I thought to myself, surely I could find it in myself to forgive people who have experienced the despair of being forgotten and unforgiven. So by the time the second week rolled around, I was really glad I had my name on the list, and I couldn't wait to go back and hear their stories and learn more about what I could do to help. Thank you. Um, well, I went out on the first night that, that Nancy uh, referred to, and that was my second trip to River Bend. And um, both experiences, as, as Nancy said, were life changing. Um, the first time that I had gone was last year, I believe, for their Good Friday service, which was in the same room that we met in. Uh, that night. And um, as you might not be too surprised to hear, Nashville has a lot of talented musicians in their prisons. And it was one of the most moving and inspirational services I have ever heard in my life. And a couple of people were at both, at both the times that I went. I had gone to um, the Tennessee Prison for Women several times. Um, but, I, but I've only been to River Bend once. And I I experienced the same, um, I observed the same phenomenon that Nancy did um, because Nancy, her question was almost one of the first that were asked of them, I think. And, and like her, I thought, well, I'm going to be interested to see, you know, what their demeanor is. And, and as she said, there was no judgment. So there's, um, they have, they obviously have some natural leaders among them. and. Uh, one of them was on the first row, and he went into some detail about why they end up back in prison. And of course, as you might guess, a lot of it is because it's very difficult for them to have a chance to um, improve their lives when they get out. I mean, they're just, the support systems just aren't there. And um, so that that was kind of interesting that um, that he was kind of, he and others were willing to um, to kind of meet us where we were on our own, sort of sort of on our own terms with our own, um, I don't know, I guess you'd call it maybe preconceptions or our own concerns and, and that sort of thing. So we were there for, what, two hours or something like that? So we got to hear a lot of different points of view. One person who stands out uh, in my mind was a, a young man named Evan who didn't say very much, but what he did say was um, that he felt that since he was in prison, that he had disappeared, that he was no longer seen. And that just, that spoke volumes to me because I think, you know, I always want to think every, about everything in terms of history. That's just what I do. And I think about all the times that we have made people invisible so that we don't have to confront the injustice and the inequities and that sort of thing. And I thought the way he put that was as eloquent as anyone I have ever heard. He was, he was not hostile. He just said it very quietly and he said very little else for the rest of the time. Um, there was another man on the back row who was a kind of a comic, I would say. 
And I think, if I'm remembering correctly, that he was there for murder. Isn't that right? And he asked us, can you forgive me? You know, do you really think you could forgive me if that was one of your relatives? And he challenged us to think about that. And there was another man sitting close to him who asked us several times, because he knew we were, we were, he knew we were church people. He said, where is the forgiveness? He said, are, the, are you people not reading the Bible? Where is the forgiveness? You know, is forgiveness only for people who haven't done very, really bad things? You know, and, um, but we, we did, uh, the longer we were there, I would say the more our comfort level went up. I think Thomas and Preston were more comfortable than Nancy and I because they've just been in that environment so many more times than we have. Although I, I have to say I'm anxious to go back. <laughs> uh, and I've also found that that's the case. And anybody that I have ever talked to, I know my, uh, Preston is, is my nephew. I don't know if I mentioned that or not, but his parents are here, my sister and her husband, and they have been involved in prison ministry for several decades. And the first time I went to a prison was with my sister to the, um, it's the jail, isn't it? The county jail to uh, help her uh, with the worship service. And, um, and you always have a, a little bit of anxiety when you walk past the razor fence and, and you know, you have to get frisked and it's kind of up close and personal. And, and um, you know, you just kind of, you know, you just kind of get nervous about it. But the more you go, the more you think, oh, well, you know, let's do this and we'll get it over with and then we'll be in, in there. So I'm hoping to get um, as, um, as accustomed to being in the prison community and having those people as part of my community and me part, being part of theirs as my family members are. And um, so uh, I think that part of that has to be not hedging the issues, is confronting them head on. And um, I thought about, uh, while I was sitting there, I thought about my brother-in-law, Mike, who is here today. And Mike, I'll probably get this story wrong, but there was a prisoner that you had made friends with where you do your work. and. Um, he had gotten out, and when you went back, he was back. And you said, what did you do? <laughs> That's what I'm remembering. And he said, well, you know, I robbed a six-pack store. And he said, but Brother Mike, I thought about what you said, and I didn't kill the counter guy. <laughs> and <laughs> is that about right? Pretty close. Pretty close, <laughs> yeah. And I thought, well, you know, the relationships that we make, <laughs> um, I, think they, I think they mean a lot to these people, and, and as Nancy says, these people change our lives as much as, probably more than what we can do for them, because they they show us what it's like to be marginalized, because we're not really, none of us are really marginalized, I mean, you know, not not to the extent that we're talking about here, I mean, these are, these are people who, who have basically been thrown away. These are people who are considered disposable, even by the churches, maybe even especially by the churches. And they know that. And they also know that there's a lot of disagreement among the churches about um, what, you know, about the level of forgiveness. There's a, and, and they know that. They know the hypocrisy. In fact, it's the word that they were willing to use fairly freely. Once again, in a fairly non judgmental way. But they, are, they feel frustrated because they know, so many of them know the scriptures and they know that Jesus said to visit the prisoners, to visit the prisons. And he didn't specify to only visit prisoners who had done certain things. He didn't specify, he just said be there. And I think that's one of the things that people like me, I don't have any training in any sort of counseling or I'm not a minister. Um, I'm a librarian and an archivist, but I can be there and I can listen. And I think that's what I have to offer. But it's really not about me. It's, it's really about them. It's about them knowing that we know that they're human beings, that God loves them because, because they're his children. And I think that they, that they want us to understand that as much as anything else. Uh, one of the things that 
stood out to me when when we posed the question, what, and I think we kind of phrased the question two two different ways. We said, what do you need from the church, either right now where you are as as someone who is incarcerated, or you know if you're going to be released, what will you need from the church? in order to be successful in in being released from prison. And then the the other side of the question was, what is not helpful? You know, what have you seen from churches that either is not helpful or is just outright destructive? And the response that we got that stands out to me is that generally they didn't find our traditional models of prison ministry helpful at all. They said, it's nice that y'all are coming out here to do worship services, but sometimes the manner in which church folks go out to do those worship services does more harm than good. And they said, it's it's because, you know, you come out here and you preach to us or you pray, you know, in front of us or you read in front of us. And the posture is always that you are good and we are bad, that you have something that we need, that you you know something that we need to do and we just haven't done it yet. And the whole thing, they didn't use the word paternalistic, but it's what I thought of, that the whole thing felt very paternalistic and heavy-handed. And, and they said, you know, so one person said, I've been a Christian for I forget how long. He said, I don't need to get saved again. I don't need a preacher coming out here telling me to get saved. You know, I need something else. I need a friend. I need somebody to to kind of walk with me and support me and encourage me and listen to me. But I don't need to be preached at anymore. Uh, And they gave us an example of a church that that is doing a a better job, I think, of prison ministry, kind of an alternative model. Maybe we can get to to that in just a minute. But uh, I really appreciated hearing that point of view um, because I can see how somebody would feel that way. You know, somebody who you know, has, has been a Christian for years and knows the Bible backwards and forwards to have somebody come out there and just tell them you need to just get saved, you need to just accept Jesus and turn your life around over and over and over again, that would start to do more harm than good and just reinforce that dichotomy that we on the outside are good and you on the inside are bad. Um, and it reminded me of a, of a quote that I read, and I'm trying to remember, I think it was in uh, Richard Snyder's book, um, the Protestant ethic and the spirit of punishment. And what he says is that, and I can't quote it, but but he says, we have to be real careful. It's a dangerous thing to go through life, you know, with the perspective, your worldview is, that you are being Jesus to the world. Particularly doing prison work that way, thinking that you're taking Jesus in there with you. He said it's a much, much humbler thing to see Jesus in other people and to think I'm going into prison to meet Jesus, to learn from Jesus, not I'm going in there to make Jesus known to all these heathens, these sinners. And and changing the paradigm there makes all the difference in the world, I think, in how we do prison ministry. Uh, and I think that's, that's one comment that really struck me as, as being profoundly helpful as somebody who wants to continue to, to try to work in prisons but in ways that are helpful uh, and and not damaging. Yeah, I want to I want to add a little bit to that. Um, what what I've been taking away uh, from from these recent visits was was a sense that there was a recurring theme there that that we're struggling with um, as human beings. Very generally, we're struggling with ignorance and fear. Those are those are the two major struggles that that we're that, that we're engaged in, and and that in, in my experience and just from being in those encounters, the only thing that that helps overcome ignorance and fear, in, in a true sense, is community. Um, that there's I, I can't overcome my fear by myself. I have to come closer with whom or what I fear in order to, to overcome that fear or to, or to realize that it's entirely unfounded. There's no, there's no reason for it. 
and and I heard very similar things again and again in our in our conversations um, with uh, with the with the insiders, where where there was an immense frustration about you don't know what's going on. Um, you, you you live you live in this society and you have no idea um, what's happening with with our criminal justice system. And I have to say, you're right. I have no idea because it it's not part of my world. And and the only way to overcome that, my sense is, is to stay in community with with the guys uh, on the other side of the gate. There's no there's no other way around it. I can read you know seven smart books, that, that that's that's cool, but but that won't make any difference for them, and it will ultimately make no difference for me and for us, and. And so I come at it from a, from a very personal angle in thinking what's, what's going to help continue to break me open and transform me. I have to be there. I have to be there. I can't do this from outside. And the other interest that, that's kind of continuing to grow is, is for me as a, um, as a leader of a congregation where I think this is, a, this is not just a justice issue. This is not just a political issue. This is a profoundly spiritual uh, uh, thing we need to wrestle with because we have to ask ourselves why why are we so punitive what is it about us that we're so willing to sink millions of dollars into into incarceration and every time we talk about raising taxes for education there's just screaming what is going on there is it okay to invest in protecting myself, but it's not okay to invest in raising up others. So to me, that gets very, very deep, very, very quickly. And, and in order, f I think, in order for us to wrestle with that in a meaningful way, we have to be there. We have to um, engage with one another. And um, I found it personally transformative, and I think it would be Profoundly transformative uh, for the church, whatever that is, you know. But for for our little community, um, to to engage with with uh, people that we've basically locked out and thrown away the keys in other ways. Okay. I'd like to add something, and I think those of you who know me know that I know no strangers. And that's because I respect all people. And like when I go to prison too, they're like my next door neighbor. Or, and I have this real sense of personalness with them because I respect them for who they are and where they are at that given time. And therefore I can be with them. But I think we have to have that respect on the front end. I'm going to visit somebody like I would in the hospital or I see somebody on the street, it's, you know, you're a prisoner, or and I'm coming to see you, I hope to learn something from you, but it is the gift of total self that you have to be willing to give, and I share that with a couple people here today even that I hadn't met, and because I introduced myself, they asked for help or something, and it's just because I'm a person and I love people and I think that has to go with being who you are. And each of you are very personable and to be afraid to go into those situations. It, I don't think the fear very much. You know, I don't like the idea of having to be frisk every time when they know that I was just there and you know, whether I go as chaplain, nurse or because you're there, you're not. Different rules. <laughs> so I just offer that. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I'm working right now on a master's thesis on forgiveness in the prison context. And a couple of you have mentioned forgiveness and the idea of forgiveness that came up when you went out to Riverbend. So I was wondering if, if you'd be interested in saying a little bit more about that. I'm, I'm curious as to what. Um, <laughs> how you think forgiveness would play out between, for instance, maybe yourself and those who you're meeting on the inside, people who haven't actually 
wronged you personally or something, but what would that look like? What would happen for you, for them? How would that play out to, to say, I, I forgive you? What would, does that make sense? What, what would be entailed in that? Well, I'll start and then I'll pass it on. Um, the, the man who um, was on the back row, who was, who, who, who was I, as far as I could tell, he would never be leaving. Uh, who had committed a murder? He, 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 I think I had, I had just made a comment or something, and he said, and he did say, "What if it was one of your family members?" Well, I, I don't know how to answer that because that's never happened to me. I've never lost a family member violently that way. I think probably forgiveness would would come kind of hard, especially at first. Um, but I do know a man. He, he's dead now, who, who lost his son and um, in a drug deal that had gone wrong. And his, his son was in his 50s, and he was killed by a 14-year-old uh, shot when he was buying drugs from him. I don't know what happened. But anyway, this, this man was up in years when it happened. He was in his 70s. And when he learned about what this young man's life had been like, he reached out to him. He said, this, this person never, ever had a chance from the cradle. And he reached out to him, and they became very close. And he was able to extend that forgiveness and look past what, he, what had happened to his son. And his son, he knew his son had been troubled for a long time as well. I like to think I would be like that, but I don't know. But um, I, don't, I also don't know that it comes down to one individual. You know, I think it's more the role of the church. Um, yes, I think the importance of forgiveness, I, I agree with it, and I think I would struggle with it if I was having that problem. But the church is, or should be, in the, in the business of reconciliation. And that means forgiveness. And I also think that because, uh, I, don't, I don't know how you feel about this, I have very mixed feelings about uh, some of the things that, that we see, the testimony from, from victims' families. Um, I, I, just, I just don't know. I, I'm, I, 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 it's not that I don't feel sorrow for them. You know, we've been seeing them a lot in the case of the Jody Arias trial and the, the siblings of the, the man that she murdered. It's not that I don't feel sympathy for them, but I'm not really sure that that's an appropriate way to achieve justice. But I don't think that forgiveness has ever entered their minds. Um, they, they want her dead. Um, and yet, you know, they probably, you know, they may, as far as I know, they come from, probably come from a Christian background, uh, that sort of thing. And our whole culture is about retribution, you know. So what I think, one of the things that I think, though, is that our own personal feelings, as understandable as they might be, I don't think they're a very good basis for deciding on public justice. Um, I, I just don't think, because we, what we feel in the emotion, in the very raw emotion of what has happened to us personally, I just don't think it's a very good basis for the construction of policy. Um, and, and, and as I say, I, w I think I would pray always to forgive, whether I could or not, I, I don't know. Well, I'm not a theologian, but I'd kind of like to be. Um, but I think that the I think that forgiveness is 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 that the notion of forgiveness may be the most important issue for the, the theological issue for the church to wrestle with right now, and it and it plays out in our prisons. Um, I, I think. Um, but I think any theology of forgiveness has to begin, it sounds trite, but I think it has to begin with the acknowledgement that we all need to be forgiven. You know, that there aren't any of us who have done so well that we don't have anything that we need to be forgiven of, and we all have been forgiven. There's a big difference, though, between us and prisoners because the prisoners have been labeled and dealt with according to the worst thing that they've ever done, and we have not. 
I don't. Th I would be surprised if any of y'all, even family members out there, if any of y'all know the worst thing that I've ever done. And you certainly don't label me according to that because you don't know it. So I don't have to live my life stigmatized by the worst thing I've ever done. And I don't know the worst thing that you've ever done. You do. If you think about it for a little while. And it would be a horrible thing if you were treated according to that worst thing you've ever done for the rest of your life. If all of us got to label you and deal with you accordingly. That's a, that's a frightening thing. And that's where the prisoners are. You know, they've been labeled and dealt with and stigmatized and warehoused and despised and, and discarded because of the worst thing that they've ever done. So we're the same, but we're being treated differently. And I think that that throws the whole notion of forgiveness off balance just a little bit uh, because it's like they have an open wound that I'm, I'm seeing and, I, and they can't see my open wound. And so what I've been fortunate enough to do, really, I think, by the grace of God uh, on a couple of occasions is ask for forgiveness from prisoners. Uh, I used to be a prosecutor. I kind of went through a, a conversion experience and kind of a faith crisis, and, and I'm trying to kind of come out of it, but I'm not sure exactly what that's going to look like completely. But a, a, a week ago Friday night, I was in front of a group of prisoners, and I apologized to them. I told them my story, and I asked them to forgive me, and then they did. And it was remarkable. And they didn't ask me to forgive them, you know, because I, I feel like they've asked for forgiveness enough, you know. I mean, but I asked them to forgive me, and I, I think that that's kind of where we have to begin. Uh, and again, that kind of turns the whole notion of prison ministry on its head. When we're, we, the good ones, the church ones, go in there and ask for forgiveness. Um, when, when I was still with the Attorney General's office, I had a horrible case um, in, in which a, uh, uh, a little boy was killed, a victim of child abuse. And I won't go into the facts of it, but it was terrible. Um, and and when, I, when I had that case, I thought to myself, I was so angry. I was so angry at the man who abused that child. But then I thought, well, and, and I guess I was just, just really, I was haunted by it. But as I kind of contemplated it, I thought, well, what if the little child had not died? What if the little child had grown up to become a man, having continued to be abused like that? It becomes a man, and then he, too, acts out violently. Would I expect anything different? I was so angry at the abuser. But then I thought, well, if, if that little boy had survived and had grown up and had become abusive himself, would I have expected any differently? Did, or is that just kind of what you would expect? But then we ask, we, we, we pretend like he was autonomous and should have known better. And then we insist that he grovel for our forgiveness from inside a prison. Shouldn't it be me going to him? Shouldn't it be the church going to him saying, I don't know where we were. When this was happening to you, this heartbreaking story. And while you were a victim, we felt sorry for you, but as soon as you act out violently yourself, we become agents of vengeance against you. Uh, I feel like the church has a lot to apologize for to those folks in prison. Um, and I think that that's, that's where, I think that's where Matthew 25 really, really where the rubber hits the road is, is understanding that what we do for them, we're doing for Jesus. I certainly wouldn't ask Jesus to apologize for anything. Uh, I would go to him and I would apologize for all the ways that I've been unfaithful and all the ways that I let him down. Um, but I appreciate the question. That's, that's, that's really, that's the brass tax on it. You have to be careful too about like domestic abuse comes to mind and preaching forgiveness from the pulpit can be like extremely damaging for victims. You know, I think I think that and I'm wondering if you guys can speak to this a little bit, like I don't know that forgiveness in, in cases of abuse and like murder can necessarily be preached or expected from victims or victims' parents. <coughs> um, or victims' families, or whatever. 
I'm wondering what it looks like to not, or if it's at all dangerous to even expect that and like need that for for feeling of like healing or something. Because like you may never get that if somebody who's harmed somebody, you may never get forgiveness. And so I'm wondering like how do you deal with that in terms of what do you think it like how how can you help somebody forgive themselves as opposed to expecting and needing forgiveness from another in order to be healed or to move on or you know to to feel any sort of like wholeness after that um another great point um no i don't think that we should make victims or victims families feel like they're dropping the ball if, if they don't forgive a person. I think, though, that preaching forgiveness starts way before somebody turns out to be the victim of abuse. Um, I think that preaching forgiveness is just the, the task of the church in general, but it's got to be done well, which I'm, I may circle back to. Um, the best example I know is what happened in Amish country a few years ago when that person went into the school and, 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 you know, hurt those babies. Um, nobody had to preach to the Amish. You got to forgive that person. Forgiveness was so a way of life for them. Um, they had been practicing forgiveness in their faith community for generations. And they were ready to forgive when the time came, even in that horrible tragedy because they had been walking in the way of forgiveness for years and years and years and years. So had they not, and so that was their natural response. Had they not, it wouldn't be fair to go in and say, hey, we want you to forgive now, even though you've not been trained in it at all. Unfortunately, that's the difference in the, in the, in the church, in their church and the church as I have experienced it, is that I don't feel like the church as I've experienced it forms forgiving people. What I think we've ended up with is preaching forgiveness for my own sins, but you know, on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, we're not training ourselves to be forgiving people. So when I teach this stuff, when I've taught this stuff in the past, I use an article from a few years ago where uh, an Egyptian uh, store owner off of Gallatin Road, somebody robbed the store and murdered the store owner, and this person was a member of the Egyptian Coptic Church. And they interviewed some of the church members, including the priest of the church. And the priest said, we expect the death penalty for all three people who did this, including the juvenile. Well, that's unconstitutional. You, you can't execute a juvenile. But here's a Christian priest saying, we expect vengeance to the full extent of the law. That's what justice looks like to us. We want even the juvenile to be killed for this. They're, we're not training ourselves in forgiveness. So certainly when something like that happens, you know, you, you can't expect somebody to forgive. The question is, you know, are we going to start becoming a people who are formed and prepared to forgive? Uh, never is something that needs to be insisted on like you're only a Christian if you can forgive your abuser because that's just additional victimization. Um, but it, but as, a, as a theology, you know, understanding uh, that we're all in need of forgiveness, you know, when, when the time comes, whether it's something big or small, will that be our knee-jerk response? Right now, violence is our knee-jerk response. Yeah, I, I want to um, address that briefly, too. We had a, uh, was in the fall of last year, I think, uh, we were invited to an interfaith uh, kind of forum, kind of like a panel like this, you know, and there was the, the rabbi, the priest, and the preacher, and uh, and, 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 and a Muslim uh, buddy of ours. And we were supposed to talk about forgiveness and, and reconciliation um, inside the prison. It was, uh, it was fascinating just to, you know, kind of think about these terms in an environment where they rarely come up. You know, no, nope, no, nope. I mean, maybe for those guys that are there, but, but in, in our outside thinking, uh, forgiveness and reconciliation are not terms that we immediately jump to. We need to think about criminal justice and, and, uh, and our prison systems. So that was fascinating. And, and, and in that, on that evening, I was the one kind of always pushing back. I was the one always going, not so, not so fast. Uh, for, forgiveness is hard work. 
uh, forgiveness is not something that you just do. That's something that you have to live after you've attempted to do that. That's a, that's a, a recommitment to each other in a, in a way that you weren't before. It's a, it's a healing of community. So there, there have to be other models. It's not just, uh, okay, I forgive you and walk away. It's, uh, I will work with you so we might be forgiven. We might live in forgiveness. We might live as reconciled people. And in, in some cases, I know that, that that's a lifetime commitment. That's not, not just a matter of a process that you go through as a victim and an offender. That's going to be the rest of your life. And I don't see anything wrong with that. And, and that's where I think our, our, our teaching is too easy, you know, to just say, uh, you know, you forgive it and you move on. No. <laughs> you, you forgive and you stay put. Uh, because that's that, that, that's a beginning. That's not a culmination of something. And so I think we all have have a lot to 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 learn there. That we just have our haven't thought through um, what we're doing. Um, I would also add that um, coming back to our visit to River Bend, um, these these men know that the work of forgiveness is very hard. They're very well aware of that. And they, um, they give voice to that understanding very, very eloquently. And, um, and in fact, I think they are almost puzzled to know if we actually can accomplish it because, because they understand that. I just wanted to add on forgiveness, I don't know. Maybe some of y'all uh, read a book, uh, The Hiding Place by Corey Tim Boone. And that's a good example of forgiveness right there. Can I just make a comment? I think I'll bet you'll all agree. From the time that might begin prison ministry, I think that, that it was just um, incredible to us when we get, came into discussions with these folks who had been insiders and then as they became outsiders sometimes we would stay in touch and you know sometimes they'd come into our homes and you know just things like that um you don't have to ever go in there i mean preston was talking about the traditional worship service and how often it fails to meet their needs really um i do find that it's very helpful to a lot of the people that i visit in the, the county prison because a lot of them, those folks are christian and they are used to teaching from the Bible. And, and we, we even take in communion emblems and serve communion. And this is something very near and dear to them. And they look forward to that. But as far as going in there and preaching at them, um, you don't need to do that. Now, you might need to do that at the people sitting on the pew beside you in your church. Sometimes that, those hearts are kind of hardened nuts to crack. But those people are broken. And they know that they are. And they know how much in need of a Savior they are and, and, and a Redeemer. And, you know, that's what they're, that's what their vast majority of them are concerned with. Not necessarily forgiveness from society. Uh, I've, ta I've talked to them, you know, whose fathers were, were elders in the, in the church. And just, what, what would he think of me? Just the disappointment, you know, that, that I've been to, to my dad and that kind of thing. Just broken. And, and I think it's just like Preston mentioned, it's just very valuable to go in there and say, you know, I'm broken too. Right. Yeah. My sin breaks the heart of God. And it's no different from yours, except that yours contradicts man's law. But mine contradicts God's law, which is worse. <coughs> Thank you. You mentioned the Amish, and I'm particularly interested in the Amish, and uh, I actually read Amish periodicals. <laughs> and uh, they won't even, at least those who feel like they are you know, following the tenets of their faith, they won't even testify against burglars who break into their house. And it leads me to a, um, a question that 
I find difficult and a little bit dangerous, especially since I'm married to a lawyer. But how much does our need in not just criminal areas, but in civil areas, our need to defend our own rights, our, you know, to make sure that we are always getting our rights, and we believe in rights. I mean, we've talked today about human rights, and yet it seems that our society is so focused on everybody getting what they deserve, and if your neighbor crosses a line, and this happened to us, our neighbor built a fence on our property and we made him move it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Is Do we have to go further in our thinking and be so countercultural as are the Amish in order to really become forgiving people? Does that make any sense? Because I, I struggle with verbalizing it, and I don't want to throw rights out the window, but is part of our history as Americans to be obsessed, really, with our human rights, our individual rights. Go ahead. I was just going to say that when I was talking about forgiveness and the unforgiven and the forgotten, um, through I. I think it's a work in progress for sure, but I don't think that forgiveness means that we forget. And I don't think that forgiveness means a sentence is forgotten. So uh, I think that those are two different things. We talk a lot about the parole system. And, and, and by the way, we were with a, a population of inmates that had been there 20, 30, 40, 50 years and some that were never going to get out, some that went in when they were 18 and now they're 50 years old. I mean, can you imagine? Think about what I was like when I was 18. And the person I've become through those decades, it's so, it, it, I'm not the same person. And so I, when I see these people who've been there, and like I said, had a lot of time to think about what they had done, um, I, have, I was in more of a place to forgive, not to forget, but definitely forgive. How were the uh, inmates chosen to be uh, present for you? Was this an open field, or was it? We uh, were selected? in the part of the prison, and y'all tell me if I'm wrong. That their good behaviors, they they had. There are different levels. So these people were, most of them, I think, had committed murder um, and uh, probably and or rape and were had not committed a violent act during the time that they were there. So they, is that right? Yeah, I remember uh, they, they did just a general call out when we got there. And some folks showed up not knowing what it was, you know, but it just kind of sounded interesting. And from the first week to the second week, we got quite a few new folks, you know, because people went and, and told their friends, you know, that this was an interesting open dialogue. Um, and, and, you know, like, like uh, Nancy has said, we, we talked about a lot of different stuff. I mean, we talked about everything from, from atonement theology to personal responsibility, to why the parole board is not functioning well and how it needs to be scrapped. Um, so I, we went out there and we basically, you know, just kind of asked an open-ended question, hey, you know, what do you guys need? And it's like, you know, the, the dam was released, uh, which made me think that they need the, the opportunity to talk. They want somebody to listen. You know, they, they have personal needs. There are systemic issues that they want to see addressed. Uh, at one point afterwards, I was talking to a guy and I said, you know, the, the handful of us who are up here, and of course Thomas is, is a pastor of a 200-member congregation, we're not going to get the parole board changed. Uh, that's not the point. The point is that is important to these folks, and they need to talk about it, and they need to have somebody listen to them talk about it and say, Yes, I hear what you're saying. I didn't know about that issue, 
And from what you're telling me, it is a horribly flawed, broken system that needs to, something needs to happen. Um, and, and I can go in and get educated about that, and I can write a letter to my congressman or something like that. But, but you know, in, in one sense, the real work is just listening, having somebody there that cares what their concerns are, you know. And, and I think that's, that's what the draw was, because after week one, we saw a lot of new people. Because, like, hey, here's a group of people who just want to listen. They just want to listen, and they want to learn. Um, and we told them, we said, this is going to be presented at, at this little conference on May the 18th. So whatever you've got to say, say it. And we didn't have to ask twice because they, 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 I think, want people, like we all do, we all want to be listened to. You mentioned earlier a uh, church whose prison ministry is affected. Could we hear a little more about that? Jeannie, would you or Janet mind coming up here and talking let's, about... Let's say that. Can, do you want to just hold on? Hold on. We're we running out of time. Yeah, but we have a session, you know, this afternoon. Yeah. We'll tell you what. This. Would y'all remember to talk about the the Methodist Church? Perfect. Perfect. How are we doing on time? Yeah, we're, we're, a couple more minutes. A couple more. Did you want to say something about the CIC? Yeah. 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 I don't blame you. What I about, wouldn't want to either. <laughs> what about forgiveness when there is no repentance? As someone who comes from a family that lived for generations in fear of the Klan as ethnic and religious minorities, when people are convicted of a crime and their response to their conviction is, well, they needed killing, how do you respond to that? Because when I read the Gospels, Jesus links forgiveness with repentance. And if they don't repent for their crimes, aren't they rejecting forgiveness? Talking about the work of forgiveness, like I said, takes a lot of work, and I think part of that does happen with repentance. I mean, that has to be a part of that formula, because it's not just something, oh, you're, I forgive you because Jesus told me I should forgive people. It's not like, if it's true forgiveness, it goes a lot deeper than that, and a lot more work is done, and I really think repentance needs to be at least part of the work I would do to forgive someone. I think we, we've, we've learned a lot uh, about how to do this well as a community from, uh, from South Africa after apartheid, where a lot of uh, wrong had been done. And, and, and there is a, you know, a large society basically embracing this, this very Christian teaching of um, reconciliation and, and forgiveness in a way that I thought was, was meaningful because they, they were very clear about the truth has to be out at first. The truth has to be spoken and heard and acknowledged before anyone can move on to anything. And so I would, I would think that that translates into all the way down to, to the individual level um, th th there may be other ways, you know, if that doesn't work, there may be other ways of dealing with, with these deep wounds that, that have been uh, struck. But I think that's, the, that's kind of the, the first approach should always been, be um, the truth has to be spoken and heard, and then we, we see what, you know, what we can do about that. I don't think, though, that that forgiveness is just something that benefits the offender. You know, like it's a gift that can be withheld from the offender until the offender repents. Forgiveness is as much for the benefit of the victim as it is for the offender. Because forgiveness, I think, in its purest form is releasing, it's releasing something, you know. Um, not, not allowing... Uh, the, the, the vengeance, you know, the seeds of vengeance to continue to grow in, in that person's heart. Uh, and so even if the person is unrepentant, you know, um, I'm, I'm not sure that that's a, a good reason for withholding forgiveness, just seeing what it can accomplish in, in the character of the victim. So I think, I think it's something that benefits both parties.